Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Vali Nasser, the Dean of uh, Johns Hopkins SAIS. And uh, it is my uh, great pleasure uh, to welcome Steve Cole, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and dean of Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism uh, to SAIS. For over 70 years, SAIS has served as a platform for policymakers, leaders, and students to engage on the critical issues shaping uh, our world. Today's event continues that tradition of dialogue by bringing leaders from across the sectors to share their expertise with our students, faculty, and the broader community. Dean Cole has been a staff writer uh, for The New Yorker since 2005, and prior to that served as a reporter, foreign correspondent, senior editor, and managing editor at the Washington Post. He also served as a CEO and president of the New America Foundation before moving to Columbia University. He is the author of seven books of nonfiction and a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. His works include the Bin Ladens, an American family in the American, an Arabian family in the American century, which I found fascinating. I, I read it to learn more about Osama bin Laden and found most of his brother to be far more interesting and intriguing. I definitely recommend that book. And also Private Empire, Exxon Mobil, and American Power. He's also the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan, and bin Laden from the Soviet invasion to September 10, 2001, which very quickly became the standard for understanding the events that led to the uh, war, Soviet war in Afghanistan, the American campaign to oust the Soviet Union from Afghanistan, and ultimately the birth of Al-Qaeda. Throughout Dean Cole's career, his work has influenced the thinking of policymakers tackling the most challenging national security issues in modern history. His latest book is no exception. Directorate S, the CIA and America's Secret Wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan, 2001 to 2016, served as a successor to his previous book, The Ghost Wars. In Director Ades, Dean Cole provides insights into how Pakistan's National, National Intelligence Service promoted its own objectives in Afghanistan, including providing sanctuary and training to members of the Taliban, while Pakistan's government has backed the US-led war. He also analyzes ways in which the US policy towards Afghanistan and Pakistan took shape during that period. With today's news out of Kabul, where twin suicide attacks targeted journalists, the need for a deeper understanding of what is happening in Afghanistan is all the more critical. And today, we're fortunate to learn from Dean Cole's years of experience as journalists analyzing American, Pakistani, and Afghan uh, participation in that war. Today's event will be moderated by Shamila Chaudhry, senior advisor at Johns Hopkins SAIS and a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute here. She worked on US policy in Afghanistan and Pakistan at the State Department and at the White House from 2007 to 2011. So thank you for joining us today, and uh, please join me in, uh, in welcoming Dean Steve Cole to the podium. He will give some remarks, and then we will have a conversation and question and answer with him. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Vali. Thank you all for coming out on such a beautiful spring day. I'm really looking forward to talking with Shamila, uh, who I worked with a little bit at New America after she came out of government. And so I'll try to keep my part of the program brief. I do want to just introduce a little bit of the, of the history in the book and to introduce it to those of you who may not be familiar with any of this material. So Ghost Wars, which came out in 2004, essentially starts with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and ends on the eve of 9-11. And it's a complex history that tries to uh, describe how uh, the response to the Soviet invasion created a context in which Al-Qaeda arose. And then it ends with the CIA's efforts to disrupt bin Laden, knowing that he's uh, 
um, planning attacks and, and then kind of concludes right on the eve of the September 11th attacks. This book, uh, which I started many years later after writing two others, opens where Ghost Wars ends, just on the eve of 9-11, and it comes forward to something like the present day. It's located in, many of the, in, in a lot of the same space as the first volume, the triangle um, among the United States, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, with international uh, terrorists in the middle of that triangle from time to time. And it tries for um, an American audience, I think, but also for an international one, my aim at least, was to deliver a thorough and reliable and multi-sided history of how it was that we started uh, from 9-11 and 17 years later are still um, mired in a war that doesn't seem to have an exit ramp. And so how exactly did that evolve and, and um, um, how should we understand the stalemate that NATO and the United States finds themselves in now in, in Afghanistan as a kind of origin story? So it's a complex uh, subject, just like the first volume. I hope it's uh, readable. I try to introduce a lot of uh, characters and take you underneath the surface of decision making in all three governments as best uh, I'm able to do with, with the methodologies available to reporters. Um, but I would say that uh, there are three themes to, to this history that I just want to tease out before Shamil and I sit down and start talking. Um, and. Uh, they're all more or less from the perspective of the United States' struggles to achieve its aims in Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban. There are many other themes that involve Pakistan and Afghanistan. I'm sure we'll get into those. The first, and it recurs uh, throughout the, the narrative, is the problem of war aims for the United States. What is it in Afghanistan that constitutes a vital interest to the United States sufficient to justify sending young men and women to, to war. And in the aftermath of 9-11, the CIA led, eventually special forces uh, led, lightning war against the Taliban, was carried out to disrupt what was presumed to be additional terrorist plotting that might have a locus in Afghanistan. It wasn't carried out to create political conditions in a post-Taliban Afghanistan. I think many people involved were surprised that the Taliban collapsed as quickly as they did. But in any event, the Bonn uh, Agreement and the Constitution that Afghanistan created after the Taliban's defeat was um, as much of an improvisation as the war, in a sense. I mean, it did draw on Afghan constitutional history, and it involved quite a remarkable array of international backers. But the plan uh, really didn't exist in January 2002. And then, uh, as the Taliban came back and the United States struggled with its response, it found itself again and again confronting this problem of, of war aims. The book keeps going back into the same secure conference room in the Eisenhower Executive Office building or into the Situation Room where these interagency debates and policy reviews, starting in the Bush administration, carrying on in the Obama administration, and the Trump administration just had one or two themselves. And there's a repetitive quality to it. It's a problem from a writer's perspective because the same problems keep getting briefed, difficult problems, arguments are mustered by very well-intentioned and generally well-informed uh, decision makers, and then they end up uh, struggling with the same decisions and, and just repeating um, errors of the past. I was, I was struck, for example, in the 2009 policy reviews, which were, uh, there were really several of them over the course of the year, um, as the Obama administration tried to rationalize the decision to <coughs> escalate the, the conventional military war by sending tens of thousands of American troops to try to uh, create conditions that would defeat al-Qaeda and to roll back the Taliban. And the interagency participants kept coming back to this question of what are our interests really in this war? 
And in the course of that review, they essentially identified two vital ones that would justify the kinds of sacrifices that were coming for American um, military personnel. One was Al-Qaeda, which was still active internationally and was along the Afghan-Pakistan border, mostly in Pakistan, but still a, a serious menace to um, the United States and Europe. And the other was Pakistan's nuclear weapons. The fear was that if they fell into the wrong hands, you could have a real cataclysm. But think about it, in 2009, neither of those problems was actually in Afghanistan, where we were about to send tens of thousands of troops. Al-Qaeda was in Pakistan at that time, uh, had fled Afghanistan for the most part late in 2001 and early 2002. And of course, Pakistan's nuclear weapons are in Pakistan. This was brought home in the Arg Palace where President Hamid Karzai uh, was then enduring a problematical election when uh, then Vice President Joe Biden went out to visit with him as the new uh, vice president. And Karzai said, um, you know, Mr. Vice President, the problem really is in Pakistan. ISI, the Pakistani intelligence service, is at the heart of this war and you need to do something about them. And Biden's response was, Mr. President, Pakistan is 50 times more important to the United States than Afghanistan. Maybe not the most diplomatic sentence ever spoken, but it had, the, it had a rootedness in the structure of the, war, of the, of the problem of the war. Um, a second theme that recurs in this history, and, and this, this problem of war aims uh, keeps getting more and more complicated as, as time goes along. At the heart of it was really a question of, are we at war with the Taliban? Is the defeat of the Taliban a necessary outcome for the United States? If so, why? There were many debates about that in the Situation Room. At one point, President Obama really certainly by the end of 2009, did not want to fight a long, grinding war against the Taliban. He was laser focused on Al Qaeda. He did not want to fight a, a never ending war against the Taliban. And his aides knew that. And they would reflect his skepticism about this at the conference table. And at one point, they said, you know, we'd never really promised to defeat the Taliban. Um, and then, the, and the, but the Pentagon, which was more enthusiastic about that aspect of the war, came back the next day with a big PowerPoint deck with all the statements of U.S. leaders over the last 10 years saying we were going to defeat the Taliban. So you may not, you may not like this, but we have in fact declared this repeatedly. Um, the second theme I wanted to mention briefly was the problem of our relationship with Hamid Karzai and our investments in constitutional Afghan politics after the Taliban's fall more generally. Now, I was sort of a beat reporter on this war for a long period of time. I started covering at the Washington Post and then I, after 2004, started going out pretty regularly for the New Yorker. And I felt like I understood Hamid Karzai as a beat reporter might. I've interviewed him a few times and gone to press conferences and seen him in various settings. And I was surprised as I got underneath the surface of decision making as I tried to chronicle as many instances where Karzai interacted with American visitors or officials or entered into negotiations with the United States over the course of the war. Surprised to discover how consistent he was in his messaging to the United States, really going all the way back to 2003, 2004. Essentially, every time he had an opportunity to talk to the United States, hoping to deliver a message at a high level, he said, you need to do more about Pakistan. You need to do more about ISI. The problem is over the border. There's a scene where then candidate Obama, the summer of 2008, travels to Afghanistan with a couple of other senators for the first time, and he's going to go in to meet the Afghan cabinet. There, it's quite a fractious bunch representing different parts of Afghan politics. They get together beforehand and they say, under Karzai's kind of chairmanship, they say, let's make sure that we all say the same thing. He could be president. And they get into the room and essentially they all say, the problem is ISI, the problem is ISI. Next, next, next. <laughs> and uh, now, of course, this was an evasion. It was an evasion of, of Karzai's own responsibility for failures of governance, for corruption at different levels of his government, even involving his own family. But it also had um, 
uh, a parallel analysis in the U.S. system where even General Stanley McChrystal, when he wrote the big campaign plan in 2009 that the greatest number of, of American soldiers were going to be asked to fight, essentially said the sanctuary in Pakistan looks like it's an existential problem for our, I mean, an intractable problem for our war, but we're going to win uh, even with the sanctuary's persistence. It would be better if we could do something about it, but we're going to be able to prevail despite it. And that proved not to be true. And as time went on with Karzai, we really confused him around this subject. We confused, I think, a lot of Afghans around the subject of the Pakistani sanctuary. Essentially, Karzai took it for granted that as the world's greatest military superpower, if we wanted to change Pakistan's conduct, we could. And then as the years went by and all the messages were delivered and nothing changed, he sunk into conspiracy thinking. He thought, well, you must want this outcome since you're not doing anything to change it. You must want to destabilize Afghanistan so that you can justify having a long-term military presence in my country. Of course, this was maddening to the Americans, and they kept trying to disabuse him of this idea, but he clung to it on the basis of his own sense of what the evidence was. Well, then, show me. Of course, he didn't take into account how unstable Pakistan was during these years, the period between 2007 and 2014, the worst domestic insurgency in Pakistan's history, the Pakistani Taliban and allies attacking institutions of the Pakistani state, even ISI blowing up its building in Lahore. So the, the, the space to put pressure on Pakistan in the way Karzai wished for simply wasn't uh, as great as perhaps he thought. But in any event, he kept repeating this and deepening this thinking that what the United States was really doing was working with the ISI to de de deliberately destabilize Afghanistan. Finally gets so frustrating, late in the Obama negotiations with Karzai, there's an envoy, James Dobbins, who was present at the Bonn Agreement and now is in charge of the AFPAC portfolio. He goes out to see uh, Karzai to try to disabuse him of this idea one last time. And he says, Mr. President, you've, you've got all the WikiLeaks materials. You've got all the Edward Snowden materials. I mean, millions and millions of classified US government documents. Do you see any trace of this conspiracy that you're describing for me? And Karzai kind of half smiles and says, maybe you don't know the plan. You might not be briefed at a high enough level. <laughs> so we confused ourselves about ISI, but we also confused the Afghans. The last thing I'll mention before uh, Shamila and I get started is just the struggle over the political strategy in the war, really from, from the beginning. I think um, it was interesting, on the book tour, I would often be on radio, like public radio, NPR shows in the morning, and the interviewer would start with um, a, a clip of President Bush's speech to the nation, to Congress, in September 2001, September 20-something, 20 21st, 22nd. And I remembered that speech as being, uh, you know, expression of national unity and determination and a very clear sense that we're going to respond and this is where we're going. And it, it, it had those characteristics in some many, many ways. But I was really struck listening to the actual words, how much the president, even at that moment, was still negotiating with the Taliban. He essentially says, you know, you still have a chance to get out of the way. Uh, we're, we're certainly going to attack anyone who harbors terrorists, and yet it's not too late. And, you know, it wasn't the most confusing set of sentences that a president has ever uttered um, in my lifetime. Uh, but, <laughs> but it was still ambiguous enough. It was just a reminder that, yes, always from the beginning, the problem of what is the political track here? Who are we negotiating with? What are we negotiating about was critical, um, and yet also repeatedly unsuccessful sometimes as a vision of what might be possible, and sometimes in the execution it was unsuccessful. After the Taliban fell was clearly the time when there was the greatest opportunity to perhaps undertake policies that might have produced a better outcome. Um, perhaps not, I don't 
believe much in counterfactual history. I don't think the world is kind of organized that way. But if you were to ask the natural question, when might we have done better, I think that was probably the best time. Um, we, for reasons of ideology, uh, eschewed what we would have called nation building at that time. So we didn't invest in a significant way when, when the peace was available. We didn't train up the Afghan security forces in a serious way during those years. We, um, we of course, we immediately turned uh, to plan for a war in Iraq um, before uh, the year 2002 was over. But there was something else that has to do with this political strategy. There was a hubris about the defeated Taliban that set in to some parts of the government, at least. Um, we failed to, I think, reflect upon the lessons of history, which is that if you win a war like the one we won against the Taliban, NATO won against the Taliban, um, yeah, you can hold leaders of the enemy force accountable. You can hold war crimes Tri trials, you can hold truth and reconciliation commissions, but you can't hold every foot soldier and sergeant and first lieutenant responsible for the fact that they participated in the enemy force. But that was more or less what we did for a few years. We had a, we had a throw them all in Guantanamo approach to people who we came across in diverse settings. And when the CIA and other institutions tried to organize a more sort of normal political rehabilitation program to try to connect former Taliban to the Karzai government, um, they were overruled. Years later, uh, we still were wrestling with whether or not there was somebody to talk to that might reduce the violence in the war, that might, uh, might uh, increase the chances for the United States to achieve its goals in Afghanistan. The book recounts um, a fascinating negotiation that the Obama administration carried out with Tayyab Aga, who was the head for a long time of the Taliban's political commission, over a possible way to create a political settlement in Afghanistan. Um, it's really a remarkable little mini history. It ended um, unsuccessfully, partly because of ISI's role in the complex uh, and partly because of Hamid Karzai's loss of confidence in the United States. And you know, the question of what might be accomplished down that channel was never really tested in that negotiation, but all of the confidence building and all of the contact and all of the kind of mutual exchange over the course of it was really fascinating. I don't think we're done with this question of political negotiations. I, I do think that if we don't uh, find a completely different path or uh, make a radical decision to pull up and leave, that um, come the next presidency in, in 2021, um, we'll still be at this war. So thank you for listening for a few minutes. I look forward to talking to Shamila. Thank you, Steve. Um, when I used to work in the State Department, a friend and I used to joke that who could, think, who could possibly think that we were responsible for conspiracies? We're far too unorganized for that. <laughs> the cars I should have known better, I think. Um, so first of all, congratulations on such a huge accomplishment. Thank you. I feel like I'm a graduate student again with these <laughs> thick books that I was taking notes on all week. Um, and just for kind of a good visual, I brought my copy of Ghost Wars, which has a lot of character and was very well used during my time at the State Department White House. Lots of notes in this. So all of that to say that you have to buy these books. You can't borrow them. <laughs> They're reference books just as much as they are telling very important stories about a, a critical region. So um, there it is. So <laughs> the book is called Director at S. And, but it's about Afghanistan. It's about the United States. Um, I know why it's called Director at S, because this is a story of uh, you know, the Pakistani intelligence service kind of assuming greater significance in Afghanistan as compared to before 2001. But I think this story is just as much about Pakistani interests um, as it is about American kind of the limits of American power. And you get into that in this book. And you talked about the broad themes, the relationship with Karzai, the confusion over war aims and what our strategy was. Those are the big picture themes. But in the book, you get into a lot of detail of those limitations. There are entire chapters devoted to uh, counterinsurgency counterinsurgency, our, our capabilities in terms of drone strikes, 
um, the fact that we didn't have enough qualified people out there. Could you talk about those limitations in a little bit more granularity? Specifically because I was asked, and I think a lot of my colleagues were asked, why isn't the US winning this war? You're throwing so much money at it. You have the best technology. You have the best people, the most organized military. How could this possibly have gone wrong? Well, I think we were, um, I, I mean, I think you're right about the title of the book. Let me start there. I, I started out, of course, your publisher wants a title that sounds like a thriller, let's be honest. So uh, I knew that that <laughs> would uh, appeal. But I had been covering Pakistan and Afghanistan since the 80s, and, and ISI and the sanctuary that it provided first to the US-backed Mujahideen and then the Taliban was always the fundamental structure of the war. And, but I really learned something about my, you, you, you learn a lot about your own work that you don't understand when you're doing it from a uh, writer named Thomas Powers, who r reviewed it for the New York Review of Books, he said, you know, the, the thing about the ISI directorate S in this history is it's not just the biggest structural problem in the war. It's also the Moby Dick. It's like everyone's excuse. It's everyone's big um, idea of where the power really lies. And, and it's always elusive, um, which is also part of the way ISI, I think, has functioned in the, in the lives of Afghans and, and decision-making of, of Karzai. All right, so to your question, I think um, you have, it's hard to separate our kind of operational limitations from our strategic limitations. Uh, but I think, the, to me, the biggest problem in this whole conflict was that we never really knew what we wanted uh, from Pakistan. And uh, we were never really sure how to explore the possibilities of change in Pakistan's attitude toward the war and attitude toward the region. Um, there was always um, an attempt to narrow the relationship with Pakistan, which the Pakistanis recognized immediately as a repetition of chapters of the relationship that they had endured before when they had been close partners and then abandoned and sanctioned and then now we're close partners again and now we're leaving again. And, um, and since so many of the, of the kind of currents of the war really ran through Pakistan, the, the failure to come up with a sustainable vision, an achievable vision of what, what could be done uh, there, I think was a huge limitation. Um, we tended to see everything through the CT prism, right? So right from the beginning, we were in close partnership with, the, with ISI when it came to the CT problem that was our priority, which was Al-Qaeda and um, the networks that had nurtured the 9-11 attacks, and they were good partners around those operations. But it was explicit for the people on the ground who knew the region that Part of the reason this operational partnership was working with ISI was that we left the Kashmiri groups alone and we didn't really ask a lot about Taliban leadership and so forth. So, you know, there's only so long that you can sustain what's essentially a tactical or transactional approach to one problem when it's nesting inside so many other problems, I think. Um, and, you know, we, as a practical matter, we, de the, the, lightning strike success of the war against the Taliban created a, an aftermath of Al-Qaeda's migration into Pakistan um, that we didn't really pay a lot of attention to as a, as a potential strategic problem as opposed to a CT problem that we were under. In other words, we didn't foresee that the combination of Al-Qaeda's migration into Pakistan and ISI's long nurturing of radical domestic groups um, might, as the government became unstable when Musharraf lost his grip, might seed essentially a domestic insurgency in Pakistan, a, you know, a country with dozens of nuclear weapons suddenly trying to keep the Pakistani Taliban out of Islamabad. And, you know, that whole um, loss of control inside Pakistan by the, by the army, by ISI, and, and, and our own, you know, kind of involvement with that, it really uh, limited our, our ability to influence events in a, in a significant way, I think. And, you know, why did that happen? Because <coughs> the number one priority for many of those years was the war in Iraq, which was also deteriorating, you know, during a lot of those years. <laughs>
Yeah, and I, I often think back to the quote unquote success of partnering with Pakistan during the, you know, the Soviet war and it worked to a certain extent. And I think if it worked once, it was only logical to think that it might work again. Um, but there clearly was a lack of focus on how Pakistan had transformed. And do you, do you think that there wasn't an understanding of how deep seated this, these Islamist trends were in the country and within the institution of the military and its investment in these various groups? Do you think that was missing? Like the eyes weren't you know, on it's, the ball? It's interesting when you go, when, yeah, a little bit, but I think, um, Going back over it, so, you know, having lived through it once as just sort of a reporter and policy person, and then, and then going back over it more as a kind of historian trying to mark the phases and the decisions yeah. and the key moments. I mean, it was striking how um, it really took the United States until 2007, 2008 to recognize what the problem was in Pakistan, and that ISI was back in the war exactly when that decision had been taken, exactly which factors were the most important ones that in taking it as circa 2005, 2006, you know, even now there's interesting mysteries about why exactly they decided to go mm -hmm. back into action, but they were clearly. And, and that by the end of the Bush administration, they got it. We understand it. And people were describing it and coming up with options about what to do about it. But by that time, the problem was so intractable mm -hmm. that even suddenly understanding its dimensions better than, you know, before didn't really help didn't solve it. <laughs> and, yeah. and there wasn't really a lot that was going to work at that stage by 2008. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, I'm not sure if you, I had a note from someone in the Bush administration who read the book and said, in this discussion with the Pakistanis late in the negotiations with the Taliban, right? So there's, there is a time, I don't know, you, you might have been out by then, but there's a kind of time when we start talking to the Pakistani high command about what it would take. What would it really take to settle the war or to get you to really do more? Um, and after a lot of disappointments and a lot of failures and a lot of bitterness, you know, there were some exchanges there that they were kind of honest, you know? And what the answer was, what would it take to kind of get something moving toward a settlement, reduce the violence, you know, stop enabling these groups? In, in the abstract, it was a bit abstract, but in the abstract, it was not unattainable. You know, I mean, it would have been acceptable to the United States. A version of it could have been acceptable to the United States, the Afghans, and the Pakistanis. And the note that came to me was like, you know, by the time they finally told us uh, what it was it would take, finally, <laughs> after all these meetings in which there was so much dissembling and so much, you know, posturing, it was too late, you know, or, was, you know, or is it too late? Um, but it was a very difficult relationship. Now, one anecdote, just to show you kind of what you know, these, the flavor of this, but in the negotiations with the Taliban about opening a... Um, political office in Qatar, which was meant to be the initial stage towards comprehensive negotiations uh, that might include the Taliban and, and the Afghan government. Uh, Ashfaq Kayani, who was then the army chief of staff, agreed to um, work with the process more than they had before, and in particular to help refine a statement that Mullah Muhammad Omar would make on the eve of the office's opening so that uh, the Taliban would be signaling that they are going to renounce their involvement with international terrorism. And, I mean, exactly what they were going to admit was the subject of the negotiation. But was, the purpose was just to say, we're going to try to become a normal political movement by opening this office. And so, Kayani comes to a meeting in Brussels that John Kerry hosts. There's a photograph of it in the book. Uh, and Hamid Karzai is there. And... He comes to the meeting at, at Truman House, where the, the NATO ambassador uh, lives, amazing estate, if you haven't, have never been there. And uh, he's walking with this, with this draft, Mullah Muhammad Omar statement, final draft. The Americans have kind of drafted a version of it, said, would this be acceptable? And now he comes in and says, I think I've got the final version. They're all huddling around, looking at it. And so, you know, he's brought it from Pakistan. I've got Mullah Muhammad Omar's statement. 
They all sit down and they go forward. So fast forward in the book research, two years later, the th whole thing falls apart. The office doesn't open, but for different reasons. But two years later, I'm going through this, trying to get the dates right and kind of dr drawing the scene together. And I realize that on the day he was standing there at Truman House saying, here's the statement. Mullah Muhammad Omar died of tuberculosis in a hospital in Karachi. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know whose notes are on this statement, but you know, that's what you're really dealing with. So yeah. <laughs> good, good luck in those negotiations. <laughs> You, all of you still want to work on AFPAC, those of you in the audience. <laughs> um, well, all right, let's talk about ISI a little bit more in detail again, because Directorate S is something separate from ISI. There are two ways to look at this. And I, I would say that Directorate S really didn't even come into my vocabulary until you know, 2010, 2011, where it was very clear to the US government that the Pakistanis were actively supporting the Taliban, and there was this group of retired and current intel guys in the Pakistani establishment that were responsible for this. We really didn't, I, I, I mean, I think the people who needed to know knew who they were, but it didn't really come into our policy discussions as a separate entity until much later. And so for those in the audience who don't have this kind of level of detail, Talk a little bit about that, and especially with regards to the command and control, who re answers to whom. I think it's very important in, because we make a lot of blanket statements about yeah, what ISI Yeah, no, I does. agree with you. Um, so ISI, Inter-Services Intelligence, is an, is an organization that serves the, the military, all three service, principal services in Pakistan, Army, Air Force, and Navy. It draws officers from all three services. Its head is typically appointed by the chief of army staff, who's the most important uh, military person in Pakistan at any given time, chief of army staff. He's supported by a group of three stars called the Corps Commanders. And he will appoint a three star as director general of ISI at the very top, serving military officer, who generally has never had any acquaintance with ISI before. Um, maybe one tour. They're, these are rotations that come laterally from the military to the top of ISI. And then, typically the person has a personal connection to the chief of army staff because you're, this person's got, got your back, but um, no previous intelligence experience. Then below that three star, there are a series of two stars that run the major directorates. So counterterrorism and analysis and so forth, those are also all serving officers without long t intelligence careers as a general matter. They may have done military intelligence, was a completely different thing facing India. But ISI is essentially a combination of you know, the FBI's counterintelligence, counterterrorism, non-proliferation bureaus, not, not all of the armed robbery stuff, but you know, the, the core national security part of the FBI and the CIA. So it's a combination of external and internal. On the internal, it also fixes elections. Um, so then between the, <laughs> which our deep state, by the way, doesn't do. No. Can I be clear about that? Uh, so <laughs> that was a joke. We're not I, that organized. Really, so that was a, okay, We're so in, uh, at the two-star level, then you come down, and now you still find uh, career-serving officers. They're out of uniform, but they're still in their services. They're still building up their pensions in the Army or the Navy or wherever. Um, but the way they staff the organization, as I understand it, this is my best understanding, um, the way they staff the organization is that, like the upper out rule in the US military, at a certain point, if they're not selected to become a general officer, then they choose a bucket to kind of settle into. And intelligence is one of the ways you can do that. And you can make that kind of career choice earlier, too. You can just slide over and say, I'm going to, I'm going to work in intelligence, sort of like becoming a foreign area officer uh, in specialist in the army, if I understand that right. Uh, and then, so that's the core of it. That's the, that's the military backbone of ISI. So it is a command and control military operation all the way down to the, to the sergeants and the NCOs. However, there's also a very large civilian employment component to ISI. And this is where, you know, it's, I can meet a lot. Of, I have met many of the people in the roles I've just described over the years, going back to the 80s. Um, 
Civilians are a much shadowy bunch. I mean, mm. I've met the civilian side of ISI in the sense that they have followed me. <laughs> <laughs> they sit across me, you know, from me in the breakfast uh, lounge sometimes, but I haven't actually gone up and introduced myself <laughs> to them and asked them about their we, backgrounds. We all know them yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and supposedly the civilians do, you know, some of the dirty work, the watching, the, I'm sure they do administration, various other things. Um, and then, now we get to the really the layered part, which is then there are the contractors and the retirees and the cutouts and the foundations and the, and the sort of separate organizations that are used to create deniability around, you know, covert operations or support for internationally listed terrorist groups and so forth. And that's where you get the retirees and the, you know, the, these retirees, though, I mean, if you looked in the open sources, by far the clearest file on, a, on how ISI works is the Mumbai uh, mm. ca uh, prosecution that was mostly, mm. you know, surfaces in, in prosecutions in the U.S. system. It was a lot of FBI and, and Indian uh, investigations. And, um, and it's, it's clear that the contractors who are include retired, um, I think a retired brigadier, a couple of retired colonels, a retired major. I mean, these guys are not retired. They're just contractors. I mean, they may be out of their pensions, but they're clearly um, actively in touch with serving decision makers in ISI. And they're organizing long surveillance operations and planning cycles, and then they, they fund and support this highly elaborate attack involving hijacking of boats and you know communications and so forth and you know it's sort of a, and and then we get mumbai you know a worldwide television spectacular uh more than well more than 100 dead um and pakistan gets caught red-handed within 48 hours of the attack i mean the, all the the Telephones come right back to Karachi. They're listening in to the command room. They record the SIGINT of giving instructions. And it kind of begs the question, well, who thought this was a good idea? I mean, what was the strategic, who made the decision to run this operation? This is not like a three guys run across the border and hit some military cantonment to show the Indians were still in the game. This is like a huge national setback for Pakistan to be busted doing something like this. And I was talking to some, uh, intelligence officers in another service and they said you know this is the way it works in a lot of uh, settings you get strategic direction from the top uh, the strategic direction is you know make in the kick India in the knees make them deliver a blow we need we need to show that we're doing something uh, here and then the guys go down and they come up with this cockamamie plan you know that involves ends up making a made-for-tv terrorist disaster and and then, they, and they're operationally sloppy, they get caught right away. And, and then somebody says, who, who gave you permission to do that? Whatever the permission is, was, is now withdrawn. <laughs> and, and that's just the way it goes, you know? And, and so, you know, did they go, how high up did they go saying, this is the plan, we've got the boats, we're gonna hijack a fishing vessel, we're gonna kill the captain, we're gonna float into Nariman Point. I mean. I, the, the most interesting hypothesis I've heard about Mumbai, and I'll stop, was from someone who said, you know, if you think, again, it's about this context of how unstable Pakistan was. And you said, has Pakistan changed because of the Islamicization? Definitely there's been soft and hard forms of um, drift in Pakistan mm -hmm. during the last 20 years. But, you know, in the context of what we're talking about, one of the biggest changes, one of the newest elements in Pakistan was the fact that they were having a civil war in the middle of, uh, of, of our war in Afghanistan. I mean, it was low grade, but tens of thousands of people died in those years between, you know, the fall of Musharraf, the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, and say 2013, 2014, when they started to get a grip again. And the panic that that set off and the chaos inside the system. And, you know, ISI was blown up in Lahore. And so the hypothesis I've heard is, the problem in the insurgency within Pakistan was that a lot of previously loyal militants at Lashkar, who had been in the Red Mosque, who had been in these organizations, they basically threw down their um, membership badges and joined the revolution. And they said, I'm not going to work with groups that are lackeys of the Americans, like all you are. You take your orders from the Pakistan army, the army takes its orders from Washington. I'm really joining the revolution. And that... ISI, especially when it was on the receiving end of some of this violence, basically said, 
to its planners, we've got to do something to show our own people that we're still at war with India, you know, that we are still on their side, that we're not the enemy, that we're fighting the war that, that you want, that we're fighting your revolution, we're on your side. Now, I mean, I'd love to see minutes of a meeting where that happened, but as a, as a statement of solving the mystery about whose idea this was and how it got so out of control, it's, it's at least an interesting thought. I, I think, you know, this construct, which is, involves kind of a hall of mirrors and a lot of unknowns and questions is by design what ISI wants. I mean, yes. it, you know, they, they want it both ways. You know, they want to be able to say that the United States did this and it's wrong for doing it. And also that they don't know when something happens. It, yes. You know, they're clearly to blame. So it's, it's very much by design. You talked about the taking strategic direction from the top when you're in an intel agency. And it made me think of the CIA in a very similar way post 9-11, where um, it operated with a very broad mandate from the president and at the ground level conducted a variety of kind of covert operations, which were often in conflict with um, the ability of <coughs> diplomats and aid workers to do their work. But it was all part of one policy. This is a very different CIA than <clears throat> the one you characterized in Ghost Wars in the beginning, which is a risk-averse CIA that you know, doesn't have, um, in 2000, doesn't have the authority to directly kill bin Laden, even though Ahmad Shah Massoud said he's over here in this camp mm -hmm. and let me take, put some rockets on my donkeys and go get him. And the CIA lawyer said, please don't do that, mm -hmm. we don't have the authority. And um, so walk us through that transformation because I think there's a lot there that can explain kind of the different themes that you laid out as well. I mean, this is a very different yeah. CIA that we're talking about. Well, it becomes gradually a different CIA and on the eve of 9-11, it's still that CIA, obviously. Um, the, you know, I think having reported in, on both intelligence services, I would say that there are proportionately many more lawyers at the CIA than at ISI. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and also, you know, CIA authorities always in history since its creation have been um, a function of the president's decision making. And, you know, this is the president's action arm. That's the way that has always worked. And, you know, exactly how that relationship goes back and forth and who's in charge and who's, how, how, what the quality of that interaction is varies from administration to administration, but that's the essential, essential structure. And I think, um, you know, what happened after 9-11 was the CIA went to war, literally went to war. It was, you know, it was the, the agency in the midst of this shock that had a plan because it had been writing these plans and then having them turned down, uh, but it had at least developed them to a substantial extent and so it had something it could put on the table at a moment of national crisis and say well we can do this and the pentagon as rumsfeld as uh, then secretary of defense donald rumsfeld readily admitted later had no such plan they didn't have maps they they i think in his memoir he says so far as i could tell we were using old british maps of mm -hmm. afghanistan or they had they had sort of gps bombing coordinates but no connection about how those coordinates would connect to you know some campaign against um the, the Taliban. And so the CIA ended up in a CT first mission on the ground as paramilitaries and blended units with special forces. And that's what they did. You know, they, they built these bases along the Pakistan border. They were chasing bin Laden and uh, Zawahiri. They were, they were building militias, rough militias to do the reconnaissance. And so all of the ways that um, these and they were working with strong men to provide perimeter security at their bases while they built the rough reconnaissance militias to go out and see if there could be evidence of where the leaders of Al-Qaeda were. And that they were doing this in a territory that later, with the benefit of hindsight and experience, you could say was pretty much empty of uh, Arab Al-Qaeda, certainly after Anaconda. And, uh, but they were doing it anyway, because that was where they had access, physical access, you know, to run these operations. They, go up as close to the Pakistan border as they could and then send, send people over, try to come up the other side with Pakistani cooperation, but that cooperation, as we've discussed, was not as reliable as the unilateral things they could do. And so gradually, I mean, it became, you know, a paramilitary uh, intelligence collection and covert action uh, 
campaign. That, that's what, you know, that's what was ordered, essentially. And there was a kind of CT only, CT first kind of culture that crept in, um, and I think persisted uh, longer than it was, than it was uh, valuable. It kind of became, you know, the thing that CIA could deliver that nobody else in government could deliver as well, whether it was like the most advanced uh, UAV operations or the kind of uh, flexible paramilitary militia allied operations and, and, you know, working with special forces as well. And this was, remember now, this is, we look out at the world, American footprints in the world, this is all we're doing. But at the time, we were really in big army wars and the CIA was off doing this vital CT mission. We were in a big army war in Iraq and we were about to get into a big <laughs> army war in Afghanistan. And so this was the kind of hard edge and it influenced CIA culture. I'm, you know, um, a lot of other things were going on during this time, huge ramp up in personnel and mm -hmm. a kind of barbell of young people and older people and gaps in the middle and lots of other organizational challenges, I think, over that history. But, um, you know, the last thing I would say about your essential question, and I don't know how you would, I would be interested in your experience of this at the White House, but, you know, I've, in Ghost Wars, I, I did a lot of reporting about interagency decision making and policy that followed and, you know, a creature of Washington, I was at the you know, newspaper for a long time. I've covered a lot of interagency policy making over the years. And I was really struck nonetheless at how stovepiped our system remains, how difficult it is to unify uh, or even clarify the contradictions in diverse lines of action if there's a big war going on especially, but maybe even without that problem uh, to complicate it. But I, it, it sort of makes you feel like if you're president, which uh, would be a very difficult job, um, it's only your force of will and the competence of your, of your kind of ability to force your policies down the system that will give you a chance to have unified outcomes. Otherwise, people just keep writing this generalized framework policy advice and then everyone who receives it goes and does what they were planning to do anyway was within the advice of their lawyers. And I mean, that's a little bit of a cynical way to put it, but it is still a profoundly stovepiped uh, system. And mm -hmm. the, having an honest conversation about how, uh, you know, paramilitary operations might undermine diplomacy or aid, for example, right is very difficult and people just yell at each other. There's a scene in the Situation Room where, where there, there's a discussion about corruption in September 2010 and, uh, and even Bob Gates, who is you know, Bush administration holdover and is still Secretary of Defense and was career CIA, he says to uh, Panetta, you're completely undermining our policy goals here because you're paying all the people who are showing up in all these corruption reports. Yeah. And Panetta just like, you know, dismisses them. He says, well, we do this all over the world. Next question, you know. And, yeah. and there's like a white paper about corruption, the structure of corruption. And everyone looks at the white paper <laughs> and they turn the corruption into different categories. And they say, okay, now we've got a strategy. But we haven't changed any of our conduct. Uh, and, and, and so it's, you know, that recurs uh, in, the, in the history of places. Well, I found your um, mentions of Gates to be very, and, and his kind of contributions to be the most prescient of all the principles. He mm. was always the one that was saying, probably not, that's probably not gonna work with the Pakistanis. The ISI doesn't think like that. You know, you're undermining us. I think he was very forceful in making kind of um, giving life to statements that a lot of the interagency at the bureaucratic level really couldn't give voice to. Yeah. And if I can put words in your mouth, does it, it sounded to me that you were saying, that this was a responsibility of the White House to clearly delineate policy. And did that not happen in the case of the Obama administration? And at some point in the book, you, you go into the, the reality, which was each agency was conducting its own policy and had its own perspective. And perhaps that was, it, some would argue that that's the responsibility of the White House um, and these interagency um, opportunities. Um, so, and, and also, yeah. if you specifically look at reconciliation, I want to talk about reconciliation, then we'll open it up for question. Is that what happened to the reconciliation? It is what happened to the yeah. reconciliation. Oh. I mean, and so there is this, um, this way, and it, it's, it's a kind of a mystery, I guess, as uh, 
I, I became um, struck by the extent to which this stovepiping undermined the particular objectives of the Obama administration in Pakistan and Afghanistan. You could just see there were many other factors, exhaustion, mutual embitteredness, unreliable allies, mm -hmm. and so on. But within the U.S. system, um, the stovepiping was particularly striking. And it surfaces in reconciliation because you're throwing a Hail Mary pass. The way we're going to get out of this war that we're running every day at high expense in lives and money, um, we're running it every day at high expense, but we're, we don't believe it's working. We don't have a lot of confidence that it's going to produce a result on the battlefield. So we're going to throw a Hail Mary strategic negotiation pass with the Taliban, and we're not going to bring the whole government to bear on that project. We're going to set up a secret cell of people who nobody except at the very highest levels knows about. And we're going to let them go run a pilot project of negotiating with the Taliban to see if they can come back with enough evidence hmm. to justify going all in as a government. And you know, the thing that's frustrating about that is if you look at what the Obama administration accomplished in its uh, diplomacy, all in diplomacy around Iran, notwithstanding the controversy about that deal, or the flipping however many decades of history with Cuba, you know, it's clearly an administration that when it had diplomacy and diplomatic outcomes as an objective, it could bring all the instruments of government to bear on getting to that end zone. So they got, uh, you know, Treasury and CIA, I assume, and, and the Pentagon where it was relevant, pushing on the Iranians, shaping that negotiation for, you know, mm -hmm. working with the Europeans, working with the Chinese and the Russians and bringing everything to bear to get a result, big result. Mm. And then I don't know the Cuba story as well, but no doubt that was not uh, just an isolated set of negotiations and, and talks in a safe house in Munich, which is where the Taliban negotiations were, you know, more or less assigned. And, and I just don't understand it, to be honest. I mean, the stakes in Afghanistan and Pakistan were very high. And the number of Americans who were making the ultimate sacrifice was obviously, uh, you know, animating and, and, you know, brought sober judgment to bear on the problem. I'm not suggesting anyone, you know, wasn't taking their responsibilities seriously. I just think that something about the complexity of the problem, the general exhaustion with the problem, and the natural kind of stovepiping of this particular set of policies, CT, counterinsurgency, diplomacy, you know, it just it produced an under, underwhelming result. Mm. I also think that the administration ran out of time to convince the differing opinions in the interagency to actually come to kind of one policy. I mean, they, they really weren't going to be able to bring DOD, CIA, state, to the same kind of perspective. Yeah. Then you had the embassy in Kabul, ISAF, you know, the NATO folks, and the embassy in Islamabad, all of which had their own kind of universe on this topic. So it was never going to happen, in my opinion. Yeah. And it was just, you have to try it because you have to try it, and we're running out of time, yeah. unfortunately. Um, you end the book kind of hopeful, kind of no, I, 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 we didn't talk too much about um, Afghan politics and, and kind of the internal situation, but you do end it, it's, it's kind of hopeful, where you, you're um, focusing on um, Masood's son and talking about kind of the future generation of peacemakers in the country. And I think before we open it up, just quickly give us your vision of what you think the next 10 years holds with we love doing this. <laughs> this reminds me of the tasks that I was given in, when I was at the White House. Yeah. So, um, you know, in, in the next decade or so, given the role that, say, Russia, China, um, and Iran are playing right now and how that's evolving, what do you think we should pay attention to which, uh, as yeah, students? Yeah, so I think there's, there's um, I'll just mention very quickly, three um, fault lines or lines of... Um, uh, politics that I that I would that I will watch. One is there is, and Ahmed Massoud represents this, a generation of Afghans living in cities in Afghanistan, by and large, um, that really represent something a new fact in the country. There's never been a generation like this. It's just a just a fact. There's never been a generation like this. They're young. They're numerous. 
they're plugged in, they're connected to the international community through uh, communications technology. I'm not saying that makes them um, a solution. They're also factionalized. They're also uh, mobilized to violence. Um, uh, even through this, you know, s social media has the same impact in Afghanistan. It has <laughs> uh, in lots of other places. It can be very polarizing. But they're a very powerful force in the country. And I don't know how to analyze them because there's really no precedent for, for the fullness of what they represent. Second thing is, um, you know, geo post-American geopolitics in the region. Our presence there still attracts spoilers. So, you know, Russia wants us mm -hmm. to just fail wherever we are. And so they're coming in and doing things in Afghanistan they, that are, don't naturally line up with their own interests. Um, you know, the Iranians similarly anxious about our presence and so forth. You know, if, as, as the region comes to terms with negotiations and the problem of Afghanistan's instability at a time when our leverage is shrinking, um, you know, what will, what will come out of that? You know, the, you, you could say a basis for optimism would be to observe that China, Pakistan, the Central Asian states, Iran, India, um, all have an interest in preventing Afghanistan from collapsing into another round of chaos mm -hmm. and uh, civil war that spills across borders. None of them benefits from that. Um, and, and so you would think that there would be the outlines of a stabilization uh, project in those common interests. But, um, you know, it hasn't been achieved yet, and there's not, it's not really clear where the leadership for that would come from. Uh, it's mm. not coming from the United States. It's not coming from China. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, the, the last thing I would just mention is internal Afghan politics is probably the most fragile part of the project right now. The, you know, the war is a stalemate um, for the indefinite future. The Taliban don't have an air force. They don't have an answer for our air force. Uh, our CT capabilities are very... Um, you know, strong compared to the other side's capabilities, but we can't, with our Afghan partners, take or hold enough territory to tip the war into decisive direction. So it's, you know, an archipelago of cities, some, you know, and air bridges and that sort of thing, um, which is exactly what it was, by the way, in the so post-Soviet Afghanistan when I arrived as a rookie reporter uh, in 1989, except we were on the other side. We were in the rural side. But uh, we're going to have an election in 2019 in Afghanistan, and I fear the last two elections have been destabilizing, uh, near uh, coup-making crises, um, and this one's not going to be any easier. Okay. We'll open it up for questions. Um, we will have mic runners going around. Okay. Right here. This gentleman in the middle. Please introduce yourself and your affiliation. Sure. So, Steve, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Fazul Hakmal. I am a MIPP student with uh, a st a Strategic uh, Studies concentration. Uh, I am originally from Afghanistan, and as a matter of fact, uh, this morning was a bad day for us. Uh, my sister works at the uh, Supreme Court, uh, which is right by where the attack took place today. So for most of us Afghans, when we wake up in the morning, we, the first thing we do is we call our family members to find out if any of us have died today. I mean, that's how bad it is. <clears throat> Obviously, you have spent a lot of time between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and I want to short my question by asking you, what would it take the president of Afghanistan and the United States president to convince Pakistan that it is no longer the time for them to have their pursue the, the so-called strategic depth. You know, I mean, what would it take to inspire such commitment to bring the change that we need in Pakistan's behavior, both towards Kabul and Delhi? Thank you. Yeah, that's the subject of this book, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, the the Pakistanis, as a practical matter, uh, the president of Afghan Afghanistan's recent framework offer for a peace process with Pakistan was by far the most, um, you know, aggressive or broad framing of what might be possible that we've seen so far. 
he's gone as far as it's possible to go, and even maybe farther in Afghan domestic pol politics. So there's a clear framework that involves opening the Constitution for discussion and incorporating the Taliban into Afghan politics. And the Pakistan side has certainly seen that there's already examples of this, including Hig and other groups going in. I mean, it's pretty around the edges, but it's not as if the model hasn't already been tried. What would it take to do a much bigger conversion of important elements of the Taliban into Afghan politics to unify the Afghan state against whatever rejectionists uh, stay out, as there certainly will be rejectionists? What would ISI do to keep its options open with you know, rejectionists and so on? These are all hard problems. Ultimately, what would it take for Pakistan to uh, make a different decision? There would have to be a visioning of an outcome that was stable and uh, durable from the perspective of Pakistan's decision makers. I don't think they've ever seen an outline of that type. Uh, you know, maybe they got close uh, from time to time in private conversation. And it would take China deciding that this was important enough to them to use their leverage, which is substantially greater than our leverage today over Pakistan, to, um, to move in this direction. This gentleman right over here. Thank you. I'm uh, Alan Kronstadt, Congressional Research Service. Um, so I guess in general, the groups that we believe the ISI to be providing either support for or simply tolerating inside Pakistani territory are generally motivated by religious uh, sentiments, Islamism. But you didn't say anything directly about um, whether the the people you named, the ISI officers, be they um, you know from the military or the civilian workers as well, uh, are they motivated by religious sentiment? Do they see the world this way uh, ideologically? Or uh, are they making more, you know, cold calculating decisions on behalf of Pakistani national interests as they see them? And maybe related to this, if you could provide your views on um, allegations that members of the ISI at some level knew that uh, bin Laden was in Abbottabad before May 2011. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> in okay. like two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, well, the first question is uh, one that the United States has been asking about Pakistani military officers for a long time, and um, I think sometimes the prisms, the frameworks through which we ask that question are a little self-limiting because we ask it about religious faith or religious conviction as if that's something different from nationalism in a country that was founded on the basis of religious identity. And so I think there's lots of different uh, variations from highly cynical, secular lifestyles that are ardently nationalist and that use these uh, Islamist groups as an instrument of uh, real politique to uh, places in between. I think, you know, the, probably the median of religious nationalism in the Pakistan Army Corps has shifted right over time so that, you know, one might have a personal, uh, greater instance of personal faith interacting with hard nationalism. Um, and then, you know, I was struck once uh, in traveling in the field with the Pakistan Army during, after the earthquake, uh, where I was able to sleep out with field units and stuff and go walking with them as they delivered aid. There's, I think, and I've heard this from others, there's a difference between the, um, enlisted and NCO uh, level of the army, which generally doesn't have international access the way the senior officers do, they were much more uh, openly uh, religious and nationalistic and uh, not just in, their, in the way that they thought about the world. The colonels and one stars who commanded them were much more familiar to me. So, you know, some place in between. They might be uh, you know, they might be religious uh, at different times of their lives and to different degrees, but they were, I would think of them primarily as nationalists uh, and, and a nationalism that is increasingly defined in opposition to the United States and the United States' place in the world. All right. Back there, yeah. Thank you. My name is Malik Sirajakbar. I'm a journalist from Pakistan. Uh, I have a very naive question, Steve. If you could briefly talk about the refugee part of it, because Pakistani government in the recent times has been extremely aggressive toward Afghan refugees who are staying in Pakistan by simply blaming them that uh, the terrorists recruit uh, from the uh, 
uh, refugee camps or the refugee camps are breeding grounds. How much truth is there in uh, these allegations from the Pakistani government? And how serious could a catastrophe emerge if you know, there is no peace in Afghanistan in terms of humanitarian? Is the Pakistani government willing to accept more Afghan refugees? Or how do we address the overall issue? Over these years, you have researched Afghanistan. How severe has the refugee crisis gotten? Thank you. Uh, well, I haven't been to Pakistan you know, for a couple of years, so I don't know about the current state of the refugee crisis. Um, there's a lot of displacement, obviously, from the military operations in Fatah that probably um, remains unresolved. But the larger question, I think, reminds me of something that uh, Ashfaq Kayani, who was the chief of army staff during a lot of the years that I was writing about, used to say in public and to the Americans in private quite a lot, which was, whatever the outcome of our negotiation settlement, one of our goals is to have Afghan Pashtuns facing Afghanistan and Pakistani Pashtuns facing Pakistan. So the refugees were always a problem for that, for that end state vision. And the original hope, I think, was that the post-Taliban environment in Afghanistan would attract lots of Afghan refugees home. It did, but not, uh, not a complete number. And then when the Pakistani Taliban became a problem, uh, also emanating from the same regions where many of the refugees had settled, whether along the border or in Karachi, then the CT side of the Pakistani state naturally saw those spaces as part of the problem that they were fighting. And I think they've been quite aggressive at trying to clean out, you know, clean out the problem in different ways. And the, the sort of vision you have now in a, in a just a light sketch version is that they, their goal has been, since the insurgency intensified, to push as much of the problem as they can back into Afghanistan and then try to lock down that border, which is a very difficult border to lock down. You hear them talking about building fences and walls. Obviously, you know, they're picking up uh, rhetoric from elsewhere, but the, but the actual idea of what they're doing has been clear from, you know, for, since 2009, 2010. We, in order to defend ourselves from the spillover effects of instability in Afghanistan, current and future, we just need as much of a forward defense as we can get. And so let's just keep pushing that um, without, as much of a forward defense as we can get without destabilizing our own country, which as the PTM movement suggests, you know, maybe they didn't get that calculation exactly right. Hmm. Okay. Here. Let's, let's actually take a couple of questions. Yeah, because so, it's, yeah, it's, well, it's train running so time. Here and then oh, I, I'm sorry, Ma, I have a couple. I hope your next book, by the way, is about, oh, my name is Catherine Koch. I'm retired from the, the Foreign Service and worked in South Asia. Um, I um, hope your next book, though, by the way, is how to unstove pipe Washington. The, uh, my first reference is to the Taliban. Weren't they the representatives at one point of Afghanistan here at the embassy in the United States. I'm just, in terms of all your references, what would you recall what that period was? And, and then my second more important question has to do with uh, uh, the title of your book, The CIA and American Secret Wars, which raises the question of sourcing. Could you please address the question of sourcing to your book? Thank you. Okay, and let's have Professor McLaughlin uh, a question. Let's take the, a couple. Yeah, okay. Let's take a couple. Uh, John McLaughlin, I teach here at SICE and once worked for one of the uh, organizations in the title of your book. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess which one. Uh, I, I wanted to push you a little further, Steve, on the question that Shamila asked about the future. And I'd like to uh, f put it this way. Um, this president clearly had to be talked into staying. And when you read the results of that discussion and the policy that he's put forward, it sounds to me like the policy is people persuaded him to just keep on keeping on was kind of the way I'd summarize it. But let's assume, uh, not unrealistically, that before he leaves office, he says, we're out of there. So could you paint the picture for us of Afghanistan without the United States? What does that lead to, given all of the other forces at work? All right, just one more, and then we'll... I'm Sufi Lagari with the Sindhi Foundation, mm. Steve. Oh, yeah, nice to see you. Yeah. Yes, we, <laughs> we know. Uh, I want to ask you that uh, the long decade relationship between ISI and CIA, I want to ask you the future 
larger extent uh, their impact of the U.S., Pakistan, and Afghanistan security relationship in ex means the between the relationship of the CIA and ISI. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let, me, let me start with uh, John's question. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, so um, the standard answer circa 2009 when the Obama administration was making this big commitment to the war was, we don't stabilize Afghanistan, we'll get the 1990s on steroids. We in the post-Soviet war, Afghanistan went into a terrible dark civil conflict, fought largely along ethnic lines, but with regional powers playing their part, interfering, ultimately leading to the rise of the Taliban. And the assumption has been that um, Afghanistan would be at severe risk of another round of similar war, uh, but the weapons would be bigger and the outside sponsors would be richer and maybe more determined. And it could be um, a period of, of really profound suffering in Afghanistan, even beyond the terrible days like this morning. Um, I think, you know, if you were to ask what might prevent um, that void after the U.S. withdrawal, that, with, that vacuum at that moment after the U.S. withdrawal from leading to uh, civil war, you would start with the fact that the, the regional powers um, are, are much stronger, richer and more influential than they were last time around, and, and maybe more prone to, um, to act. Now, whether that's constructive or not, <laughs> um, I'm not sure. But um, here would be the moment in the post-American world that China and India would have to decide how much um, risk they're willing to take to try to prevent uh, violence in their neighborhood that could also undermine their own stability because it would require them, uh, I think, to take actions. They, everyone's been free riding on the American presence in Afghanistan. And so the, a withdrawal would test uh, what price the regional powers are willing to pay to take responsibility for their client networks. Iran would also factor too. I mean, remember when you'll recall you were in office at the time when the first CIA teams went into the Panjshir Valley in September 2001 their biggest counterintelligence problem was that there were tons of Iranians and, <laughs> and you know, Russians and Indians around because th there was already a coalition fighting that war uh, that was more active than we were. And so I think all of that would restart. Um, would the UN and the international system with the great powers, uh, Russia and China in particular, be willing? To, to provide the kind of stabilization you know, approach after a U.S. withdrawal or during a U.S. withdrawal that would be necessary to, to try to prevent that war from restarting? I don't know. It's a post-American world, and we haven't, we haven't tested some of these problems before. And the question of sourcing, really quick. Do you I don't talk about sourcing. It's in good. the footnotes. You'd <laughs> be welcome to read the it. The right there. answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Steve, okay. for joining us. Everyone right. get the book, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.